My name is George Serra. I'm a composer and I perform live with my ensemble, the George Serra Ensemble. And this is my artist profile for the Noisy Cavern Network. Well, it started with piano lessons at 10, bass guitar lessons at 12, and dabbling with synthesizers and drum machines when I was 18. And um, being fortunate enough to see a lot of great bands perform at my high school. Uh, and, um, and post punk, new wave, goth music in the mid 80s. And um, that's how it started just playing weekend parties, booking shows at small clubs. And um, I sent a demo tape to a Belgian label that signed my band at the time and uh, we ended up touring Europe and putting out music on CD, cassette, and vinyl in 1990. That's how, that was the birth, I guess. I have two that are live um, perf performances. One is with my ensemble, the George Serra Ensemble, and it's myself on synths and bass, and I have a string trio, cello, viola, violin, and we've been playing at local venues around town. Music's instrumental. It's kind of dark, post-goth, post-industrial, uh, a lot of heavy sounds involved and crazy string arrangements um, like Stockhausen and Penderecki are some of the influences as far as strings goes. And um, musically, yeah, it's very kind of dark, grungy, industrial, math goth, math post, I'm just coming up with genres right now. Um, I'm just, yeah, inventing them as we speak. So, goth, math, goth, prog, industrial, post, whatever. Yeah. And then my other project is, I do a live uh, film score for the 1928 silent movie, The Passion of Joan of Arc. And I've been performing that all around the US and North America and Canada. Uh, it's myself, a score I wrote and it's got early music choir involved and string quartet and electronic. We, uh, it's an original score for Carl Dreyer's The Passion of Joan of Arc. And I've also done some film and TV as well. Yes. Back in 1999, a writer for the TV show Buffy the Vampire Slayer got a hold of one of my demos and was listening to it as she was writing the episodes. And there's a female werewolf character named Baruka. This is season four. And uh, she was inspired to write this character and also to incorporate that she's also a singer in a band. And wouldn't it be cool to have like my music as the music in the show? So they reached out to me and they asked me if they can license a bunch of songs. And they asked me if I wanted to be on the show to be the keyboardist. Um, so I did that. And after that experience, it really opened me up to know that um, you can be very creative and, and know that there's film and TV world that would appreciate your work and they would pay you twice as much as any record label would. And you own the music because it's a license and you get residuals. <clears throat> so it was like kind of a no-brainer. and. Um, and then I ended up just licensing more and more of my music to various film and TV and short films. And that came about through performing live. I like to play live a lot. And I'll just meet various people at my shows. Um, I did a concert at the Getty Museum and met with Poetic Kinetic, those guys. They build giant installations. Um, you've probably seen their work at Coachella as a giant astronaut and things like that and caterpillars. They were working on the 2008 Beijing Olympics and they asked me to collaborate with them on writing an original score for a piece they were doing. Um, so a lot of this happened without an agent, a manager, um, you know, just presenting your work, um, doing it live. You kind of set your own terms and, um, and just kind of happened that way. I also got a series for the Discovery Network when I performed live on KCRW's morning show. Um, they heard me on that and reached out and asked me if I wanted to work on a, a series that they were creating. Um, and 
they had already bought one of my CDs and was using the music as temporary music in the show. So they asked me if I could just create more of that kind of music. And it was like, well, these are original ideas and songs. So it almost felt like I was writing a record for them. You know, like I had total creative freedom. I guess it would be, uh, well, these are huge people. So I'm in no way like, they'd be telling me what to do. You know, it's not like, it's more like me, like, you know, in awe sitting next to them. And hopefully they let me contribute a little piece of whatever. But it'd be like Bach, Miles Davis, David Bowie. Um, I think their works are the most outstanding that I've heard. I mean, there's so many thousands, but those would be my top three. Um, I guess um, I would just, if they said, well, make a suggestion, I would just suggest that we sit down at our instruments and just play and see what happens and, you know, record whatever. And I would probably start just playing along to whatever they're doing. But, you know, th that's, that's just how it goes with music and musicians. You, when you're in a um, creative partnership, it's, you're pretty vulnerable uh, on all sides. And um, you're kind of exposing an intimate part of yourself. I think that maybe you don't share with people because it's hard to communicate your feelings uh, sometimes. So I think sitting at an instrument and just playing some ideas off each other would um, be the best way, I think. Uh, that's usually how it happens. I was involved in this project called Cambient. It's uh, sponsored by a record label up in Seattle called Real More Real Records that I've worked with on and off. And they invited me, as along with 21 other uh, musicians and sound artists, to go camping north of Seattle for three days. And they brought recording equipment with them, uh, but there was no instruments. So we all had contact mics and we were recording nature and sound and creating from that. And at first I was like, that, this is impossible, how do you do this? And then I realized that, you know, um, we would, um, I would put a contact mic in a can and then I would just pour sand over it and have it recorded and add some effects to it. Um, there was a, old Ferris wheel that was really uh, like rusty and we put contact mics on that and we'd all push it and we'd create this really intense sound which ended kind of became like this rhythmic sound and that was amazing um, and I realized that in creating music and sound you don't it's it's all around you and you can pick up on that and so it really had me um, look at just noise in a different perspective. Uh, noise not as an annoying thing, but as a, a blessing. And so it's now I, I, when I do a project every now and then, I'll put like a mic outside my room and just have a dedicated track to whatever is happening, whether it be cars driving by or whatever, or dog barking. I could put that at a lower volume and just have it in there so it's like, as a bed of the piece that I'm doing, whether it be electronic music or string quartet or whatever it is, you know, I, I like having that. And I realized like when I listen to a lot of classical music, you could hear the audience in the background, you know, and it's just no one's ever saying, well, we got to get rid of that or whatever. It's like you might hear a cough or something and it's accepted. People understand that it's a live environment and you're in a room full of people and these things are going to happen and that it's not a mistake but it's part of the whole creation. Um, so I, I really, that took me, you know, in a different level. And, I, and there's a term for it, it's called deep listening. And I understand now why they call it deep listening. It's to really hone in on sounds that are around you and appreciate that and incorporate that. So that, that's something that was really cool. And the, and the label does it once a year and they actually press those recording sessions onto vinyl and it's available. So it's not that you're just doing an exercise, it's an actual release that's, you know, on 12 inch vinyl, which is pretty cool. Melancholic, introspective, and uh, minimal. 
I think that's kind of like when I don't know. You, you know, for me, when I when I'm writing music, even if it, even if it's a band situation or if it's me by myself, I'm always kind of like looking towards within myself. Like I'm kind of. Um, I guess it was a way for me to cope with the chaos I had growing up in my family home life. That it was like an escape, and um, and so for me, that's kind of just the way I, I it's happened. Where it's it's been introspective. It's been kind of like this melancholic outlook on things, but melancholic in a way to inspire people. And um, yeah, I guess that's that. That's just you know, it's hard to hard to pinpoint because. I'm hearing some. I'm I'm hearing something different from what the audience hears, you know. So, so every several years, I get, I really change up my um, my instruments. Like I always have my one synth that I've had my whole, you know, for thirty years. And but as far as like synthesizers and drum machines and things like that, software that always evolves. Like I'll. I did a record using specific instruments, like a lot of old analog synthesizers, a TV303, a 909 drum machine, Jupiter 8, and I did two albums with that, and then I've never, I let that go. I sold my, nine, my 808 and um, my 909, and then I got completely different instruments, because I just, I was getting a little bored with it. So um, I think my albums have always evolved, and it's it sounds different over the years. And um, sometimes I'll lose fans, and sometimes I get new ones, and sometimes people are confused, especially when I'm trying to book a show. <clears throat> they might hear something of mine and be like, "I heard a piano concerto." I go, "Yeah, I, I've done a lot of those, but I've also done stuff that's very, uh, you know, industrial electronic, and I've also done stuff that's very ambient and noise oriented." Um, so, yeah, I, I like to mix mix the instruments up and uh, change things a bit. So um, it's like this, yeah, a, a fresh approach. I think surprise and unique because I it's hard. I, I couldn't I I couldn't say there was a best collaboration because there's been a lot of really cool people I've got been fortunate to work with. But I think just the most surprising one was with the late Angela McCluskey. She recently passed away. And she was well known as the singer for telepop music and the wall colonials and she did a lot of other collaborations people like morgan page and we worked on two songs together uh one of which was a total accident um, i was working on a piece of music that i was going to present to a different singer and angela came over and i had another song that i i would plan on working with angela and as we were testing the levels and the mics and everything, she asked me if she could just sing on top of something else I was doing, not the song that was intentionally going to be for her. <coughs> and um, so I played this one piece of song, and as we were testing the, the mics and levels and everything, I, I was recording it. And in one take, spontaneously, she sang on this piece of song, and it was just perfect. It was like... You know, I was just like so surprised that it just came together like that. And um, the track is called Anna. And um, so that was, yeah, the, the most surprising in me, you know, where, where it just was so unexpected. It was a song that I spent a long time working on. I had really, I had strings on it. I was fortunate enough to have some really great musicians play on it. Alan White from Morrissey's band played guitar on it. And... James Fernie of the Pogues played accordion, and um, it was meant for. I was I was trying to get it, give it to Hope Sandoval, and it was just a really. There were so many obstacles involved, um, and then when Angela sang on it, I remember thinking, "Oh crap! Now what do I do? You know, because <laughs> I don't want to part with this." And I was like, "You know what? There's." The whole thing when there were so many obstacles involved, I'm like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna pursue it. You know, there's, there's too many people against this. So, um, I just released it, um, the Angela version, and 
KCRW gave that a top tune of the day, and um, it ended up getting onto a couple of film scores, and I actually got a feature film out of that song. The director heard it and said, this is like really cool, and I want you to score my movie, and I was like, okay. And that movie's called Her Name Was Joe, and it's on Amazon Prime, and it keeps going back and forth between Paramount Plus and DirecTV, but Amazon Prime, you can get it. So the thing about people like Ellen White and James Fernie and people I've worked with on that caliber, they never want money. They want to do creative, cool stuff. <clears throat> and uh, it was just, I was introduced to Alan by David J of Bauhaus. David J and I worked on a song together, one for his album, one for mine, and I needed a guitarist for this song, Anna. It was finished without, there was no guitars on it. It was strings and synths. And he said, I think Alan would be open to it. Um, I sent Alan a rough demo and, and David made the introduction and Alan responded and said, you know, like in his English way, hey, this is brilliant. Yeah. And, um, and I was, it was like, he came over, he brought three guitars and he had written notes down. He brought a music stand. I was like, I, and he did like three different takes. And I just was like, and he played so well. Like it was just like, I was like, and he was like, yeah, you know, yeah, I just want to do, you know, creative stuff. And, you know, I guess, you know, he's, he, when you have success, you know, like Morrissey's co-writer, you know, like giving, you know, asking for a hundred bucks or whatever it is, it's like, it's kind of pointless at that point. You know what I mean? He just, I think he just wanted to do, work with different projects where it's like different and this was something different and uh yeah it's just you know there was like it was yeah it's like one of the you know like the easiest sessions ever and he was just so professional about it and obviously you know like right look at the people he works with uh when i travel i work with a local string quartet from whatever city and a choir when it's right now when i'm doing shows out of town it's the passion of joan of arc the live film score so it's uh, four to eight singers and a string quartet. And I usually will ask all the musicians, string players I know, if they know musicians, you know, like if I'm gonna go to Bloomington, Indiana, or if I'm gonna go to Toronto, I ask people, do you know? And it's usually someone's like, yeah, I went to college with this person. And with, with any string player, if I get a hold of a cellist, they're gonna know a quartet that they work with. And it's pretty simple, you know, and I have PDFs of the charts and they'll download it and you know of course i will like view some of their footage on youtube first just to make sure they can you know play and <laughs> but uh yeah it's usually uh, it's a pretty simple process i i guess it's like um i just feel like it's something that's been a part of my life for so long and it just comes natural that i don't think about it it's just something that happens um i guess it's a vocation and you know, it's just, it's just something that's very much a part of me, you know? So I, it's hard to say. I, I think it's just an extension of my life, you know? It's like, like, yeah, to me, it's like, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm around instruments everywhere, you know, like they're all over my room and house. And so I just sometimes pick something up and noodle something on the guitar or keyboard or whatever, you know? So. It's just something, it's, there's a curiosity factor involved too. So, I don't get, you know, I, I write when I'm inspired and when I'm not inspired, I like to do other things. I never feel like I have to do something. Um, and even when I got like the Discovery series, there was a lot of music. It was like 40 cues per episode. I did 28 of them. Um, I had so many like rough ideas that I didn't know what to do with that I had sequence on my computer and they were like all like just like a verse or a chorus or something right I didn't know and I was like wait a minute I could utilize all the stuff now because they don't need full songs you know they just need so it was like wait I'll finally like all these like ideas I had that I didn't know what to do with I could just kind of create a one minute piece like a riff and build upon that so it was exciting in that sense because like ah finally you know like 
You know, imagine if uh, people made a demo of just like guitar riffs and then get hired for a TV show and they're like, all we need are like 30 second guitar riffs. <laughs> You're gonna be like, I have it already, you know? And you'll be excited that you can get rid of it. So that was cool. Uh, and I just, uh, like with the Joan of Arc, um, I got commissioned to write a score for that. And before I started on the music, I read Joan of Arc's biography and reading the biography just totally inspired me to um, create the music because I knew I was gonna go into a genre that I never dabbed in before. That was choral music. So yeah, it, there's, it's uh, always inspiring. And then yeah, after that, I, you know, if I'm not inspired, I'm going on a hike or something. If you have artists that you support, please go and buy their material. Because streaming services are cutting fees like crazy. I think I'm, I, okay, so I'll give you one example. So Spotify has a new policy now where they don't pay you anything that's got under a thousand strings. So let's say you put out a new record and it has 10 songs on it and the album's been played in its entirely 900 times. That's 10 songs, 900 times each. That's 9,000 plays. You're not getting a penny. You're not getting anything. Um, and by that time, most people have moved on to a different record. You know, you're not gonna listen to a record 900 times. You might listen to it 50 times, 20 times, which is plenty enough, but know that artists aren't getting any money and go, you know, if you really like someone, you know, even if you bought one song on, on iTunes for 99 cents, that's still more than a thousand plays on Spotify. So, you know, it's not a lot of money for, you know, it's just, just do it, you know, or merch or whatever, or see them live. Um, that's saying, saying you need to spend, but if you, if you want to support the artist, know that the streaming services don't pay. Unless you're getting like a million streams a day, then you're getting paid. But most people aren't getting that. Um, and um, yeah, so support the artist and really try to follow them on social media. Things like that go a long way. I mean, you know, people will say, well, I like that artist, but I don't really follow him. It's like, you should follow him no matter what. Even if you ignore him, well, follow him. You know, it's important. Like showing the little bit of stuff really can like you know help any musician out there you know it means a lot so yeah the things that maybe you might think you take for granted you should just show that yeah